The next subject that we're going to talk about is called uh, Fourier transforms, or is dealing with sort of Fourier analysis. And we came across Fourier um, back in chapter four when we looked at Fourier series and how we can solve for problems where we've got a periodic signal that we know the analytical solution to, okay? And you can apply Fourier series to get a, uh, a, a bunch of, you can represent the, the, the periodic signal as a bunch of sinusoids, and then we can solve for each of those sinusoids and then add them all up together at the end to get a solution for your problem. And we went through a number of examples doing that. Um, and that was our first introduction to Fourier. Now, Fourier transforms is a sort of step beyond that. We'll start off revising some of the stuff about Fourier series that we did um, some time ago, and then move on to talk about Fourier transforms. And the, the big thing about Fourier transforms is it allows us to deal with signals that are not periodic. Okay, that's the sort of impetus behind it. Um, and it's all about sort of moving between the time domain and the frequency domain. Words you may have come across when you did control. Yeah? Back last semester, you talked about frequency domain and that sort of stuff. Well, this is sort of the, the flip side of that, because you were looking at how systems respond. Well, this is, yeah, in a sense, this is a very similar sort of concept in terms of talking about time and frequency domain. And hopefully, this little introduction will give you a sort of taste or a flavor of, of what's going to be going on. Now, the reason I've done this little introduction is because it's very abstract, the stuff that we're going to cover, OK? Um, it's got a lot of maths, OK? And I accept that some of you may think, oh, no, more, even more maths. Yeah, well, there's even more maths. There's lots of um, complex things going on. Um, it's quite abstract, and it can be quite difficult to grasp, you know, what's the meaning behind it? Why are we doing this, OK? And it's difficult for me to think of that as well. Um, so that's why I've sort of, you know, to give you a bit of a bit of a grounding to place in, in context what we're going to be doing next. Okay? And so it's quite abstract, which is why I've done this. So I thought I'd start with what is a transform. Okay? You've probably heard of things like Laplace transforms. Okay? Yeah? Control systems, or even level 2 maths, I think, you cover Laplace transforms. And here we're talking about Fourier transforms. What, let's think about what a transform is anyway. And in this case, I'm going to use Fourier as an example. We've got a function, the forcing function, okay, which is a function of time. And so you can represent that in the time domain by drawing the horizontal axis being t for time, and then your function f of t being some function, and that will take some shape, whatever that shape may be. And that's a time domain signal. Okay? And we've covered the time domain signals where they're quite easy to solve. Chapter 3 was full of time domain signals that we solved analytically, which is fine. Okay? We looked at periodic signals with the Fourier series stuff. Again, so long as you know the analytical solution to that time domain signal, you can go ahead and solve it. But there are times when that time domain signal isn't quite so easy to solve. It may not have an analytical solution. We'll talk about how we go about dealing that in, in uh, chapter 9. Um, it may be random, which is chapter 10 in the notes. Okay? Um, or it may be, like I said, non-periodic, which is what we're looking at this time. And the whole idea is you break it down into small steps and you solve each bit individually, but this allows us to, to do that. So you've got a time domain signal, it's difficult to solve. What do we do? Okay, well what you can do is you can transform that signal, or that function, into, in the case of Fourier uh, transforms, into the frequency domain. And often, not always, often that makes the problem easier to solve. Okay? A particular example of this, um, which we may go through, I haven't decided whether to run it as an example yet, is the fact that if you've got a derivative, okay, so our, our, typical, um, our typical mass spring damper problem, you've got a, a second order differential equation. Okay? Now, when you apply the Fourier transform to that differential equation, you end up getting um, a, an equation that is in it's, there's no, that's got no derivatives in, you've just simply got multiplications. It's a bit like Laplace transforms, where you replace the d by dt with an s, okay? Well, it's a bit similar to that. So you transform into frequency domain, it can be, although not always, easier to solve. You then solve the problem, and then you go back, using the inverse transform, back to the time domain, and then you've got your solution, okay? Now, I don't know whether any of you um, 
Well, let's, let's do the next slide, then I'll talk about that. So this is a sort of diagram of what I've just said. You've got your problem in the time domain, OK? It's posed to you in the time domain, and it's, as it happens, it's difficult to solve. So you apply the Fourier transform, and that takes you over to the frequency domain. So instead of something in terms of time, it's then in terms of omega, your frequency, OK? So you've got a f of omega, and it just so happens that that function that you've got, that you've transformed, is easier to solve than what you had initially. OK, if it's easier to solve, you go through and solve it, and you get a solution for that f of omega, and then you apply the inverse transform to get back to the time domain. So you've got this sort of loop thing going on, OK? So that's the sort of diagram, and like I said, I don't know whether any of you have ever, uh, whether you've got parents that did um, maths courses at university and this sort of stuff. Um, back in the days before calculators, when you had a big um, multiplication to do, um, you may have heard of log tables. Okay, now, you should all be aware that if you've got a, a log of two numbers that you multiply together, okay, that can be written as log of one number plus a log of another number, and adding up is a lot easier than multiplying. So what you do is, you basically, you've got your two big numbers, you look up in the log table what the log of those two numbers are, Again, there's no calculator, so you can't just press log that number. So you take the log of those two numbers, so you're in the log domain in a sense. You add the numbers up together, adding is a lot easier than multiplying, and then you anti-log, so you go back to your log tables, you look up the anti-log of your solution, and you get the final value. Okay? It's a similar process. You're transforming from one sort of domain to the other domain, solving it, and then moving backwards. So it makes... It's, it's a multi-step process, but it makes things a lot easier for us to deal with. And this is similar. So let's take a function in terms of time. Here's my simple rectangular, rectangular function. It's centred over um, time equals zero, which is this point here, and it's of a certain width. And it's in the time domain. Okay? This is a function in the time domain. It's quite easy to see that. I've got time along the bottom and f of t being the uh, vertical direction. Okay, so there's my function. Now we know how to deal with that if we've got a repeating function, if that's a periodic signal. So here's my analytical solution to that. f of t is 1 between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2. Okay, so that if we go back to the... Uh, this point is minus pi by 2, and this point is pi by 2. Okay, so between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2, we've got a value of 1. And there's zero everywhere else. But I've stated in the second line there that it's a periodic function. Every two pi, rate, uh, two pi seconds, it repeats itself. So we have a square wave function. Okay? We've covered square waves before. And we know that if you, you can go and find the Fourier series, which is this equation here, you can find values, um, and you can represent the function with a bunch of sinusoids and cosines. Okay? Um, and that will, the more... Um, the more values you have in this sum, the closer and closer it will represent the square wave, which is true. And if we go through and solve it, I'm not going to go through the actual maths here, because it's, you, you know how to do that. It's an even function. You can reflect it around the y-axis, so therefore all the bn terms are zero. So that's no second sign term. And if you go through the sums, you do the calculations for an, you get an to be this value for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and so on. Okay. Now you'll realise that when n is even, 2, 4, 6, you get sine of pi, or, um, or uh, you know, 2 pi, or 4 pi, and so on. Okay. And obviously, n, that's always going to be 0. So for n, when n is even, we get no values. When, is it, when n is odd, we get sine of pi by 2, which is, uh, what's that? That's plus 1. You get pi, pi of a uh, sine of 3 by, by 2, which is minus 1. And so you get this oscillation, what plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, as n goes from uh, 1 to infinity, but the odd ends only. Okay? And so, and then you, obviously this value is going to be the sort of the, the amplitude of that, and obviously as n goes up, this value gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what you can do is we can represent a n on a frequency domain or frequency spectrum diagram, and that's what it looks like. Okay, <coughs> so we can generate a frequency spectrum, frequency domain representation. If I, yep. Okay, and so you can see along the bottom we've got n omega, and up the uh, 
vertical axis, we've got a n, which is the value of that uh, function. Okay, so um, when n is one for omega one, we've got this value. Okay, when n is two, you get zero. When n is three, you get a minus a certain value. And notice the amplitude gets smaller and smaller and smaller as um, n goes up. This is just from n equals twenty. So this is a frequency domain representation of that periodic function. Okay. You may have seen something a bit like this in the, in the chapter 4 of the notes. It, it looks a little bit like this. But this is actually a n for that um, square wave function that we looked at. Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky. What happens as t goes to infinity? Okay. So you've got your square wave function, and we've said that it repeats every 2 pi seconds or whatever. Okay. What happens if that, that repeating is uh, increasing to infinity, as in there's, you know, you've got, you know, it only repeats once every millennia, or as t goes to infinity. Well, what you end up with is you end up with a function that's not periodic. You end up with just a square wave function. So if t goes to infinity, you end up with a non-periodic function, essentially. But we also know that t is 2 pi divided by omega, okay? <coughs> So what happens to omega as t goes to infinity? I could have written this as omega equals 2 pi over t. What happens if t goes to infinity? What happens to omega? Omega goes to zero, exactly. So you end up with a zero frequency. But what actually happens, if you think about it, if we go back to this uh, diagram, <coughs> we've got n omega at the bottom. and So the gap between these two omegas could be called delta omega. Okay, and what happens is is that that delta omega drops to zero, and so you end up with <coughs> instead of defining a certain amplitude for those discrete frequencies, you end up defining it for the whole lot of frequencies, any frequency that you've got for all frequencies. And so, if you repeat that process, you get a line. So, you, we, if we go back to that diagram here. We've got a bunch of points at discrete frequencies. But if you had a line, if you've got so many frequencies, for every single frequency that you're dealing with, you plot them all up as lines, okay, like this, you end up with, end up with a continuous line. And that's what happens in this case here. Okay? Now, it doesn't, because we're dealing with, end, um, with any frequency, it doesn't matter whether we've got a positive omega or negative omega, so you can actually do the whole thing it looks like that. So that is the Fourier transform of that square wave function. Okay? This is called a sync function. <coughs> and we will solve this analytically later on today. But that's the sync function. And that is the Fourier transform of that square wave function. That's what it looks like. And so for any frequency, you can see what the amplitude of a n is going to be, and then you can solve that. Okay? That's the sync function. As an example. Now, <coughs> what's going on? Well, Fourier transforms take a signal and expresses it in terms of the frequencies of the waves that make up that signal. What does that mean? Okay, well, let's take an example. Let's look at sound. Sound, as you know, is a pressure pulses moving through the air. Okay, when I vibrate my vocal cords, it vibrates the air around my vocal cords, which is then, it's a wave. Okay, waves propagate, and we'll cover that later on this semester, when we talk about waves, they propagate through the air, and you will hear that. You're, um, you've got small, very small bones in your ear that will vibrate based on the air vibrations, okay? And your brain then processes that as sound. So if you were to do F of T, <coughs> you could get a, a signal. It's not necessarily a sinusoid, but it's a signal that will, um, that will of, of the pressure variations of air moving you know, of, the, of the air molecules in the medium of air. And that's, like I said, it's a wave that moves through the air. <coughs> and so, but that doesn't make much sense to you, okay? Yes, okay, lovely, you've got a nice um, wave that's moving through the air, that's producing sound. But what you perceive, what's important, is you hear a frequency. So imagine I play a note on the piano, Okay, that vibrates the airs around, and you could look at it analytically in the sense, okay, well, that's going to give me this variation of, of, of pressure in the air, and it's going to pass through the side. Oh, yeah, great, doesn't really tell us much. Whereas 
what you perceive as a tone. Okay, you hear, you hear the tone of, say, middle C or A or whatever. Okay? And that's what's important, not the, not the pressure variations in the air. You can't look at the pressure variations and say, oh, that must be middle C. But if you take the Fourier transform of that signal, you can. Okay? You can. So it's the tone. <coughs> so the frequency is, the t it, sorry, the signal is in the time domain, okay, while the tone is in the frequency domain. Another example of this is that um, a number of years ago, I ran a final year project student that was um, commissioned by the MOD to do a thing about central gravity on, on uh, um, cruisers, you know, um, big ships. And <coughs> the current method of working out where the central gravity is when, when they've refitted it or they've you know, loaded up with cargo or whatever is to park it in a dry dock, hoist it up, and move, some, move a bunch of weights around and look what happens to the ship. And then, you know, using some mass and stuff, they can work out where the central gravity is. And the question was, is there a way that we could do this that's a lot quicker? And so, um, you know, uh, could we do it out of sea? So they refitted the ship, they take it out of sea. Is there a way we can work out where the central gravity is based on how the ship behaves in the water? Okay. Um, what you end up with, you know, basically there's, there's obviously there's a longitudinal centre of gravity and a lateral centre of gravity where they, and where they cross is the centre of gravity of the ship. And uh, I could switch and just show you what's going on. But essentially you've got two points on the ship, the centre of gravity and then where the centre of um, buoyancy is, or the, you know, where the, the point at which the ship rotates around. This is a cross section of the ship. Okay, and you have a centre of gravity, say here, and you have that centre of rotation is there. Now, the ship is going to rotate around this point, and this is, the ship is going to act like a sort of pendulum, that rocks backwards and forwards. So we know the equation of a pendulum; it's quite straightforward. We've got this distance l, whatever that is, or h. Okay, and we know the equation for a pendulum; very simple. Um, I believe it's g of l x equals zero. There's the, there's the equation for a pendulum. And if you know l, you can therefore work out, um, you can work out the frequency. And consequently, if you know the frequency, you can work out what l is. And so what this chap did is, is you get a signal of the ship moving around in the water. OK, and it's quite a noisy signal. OK, so this is in the time domain. You can look at um, pitch or, or roll. OK, so I'll call this roll. And you get a very, very noisy signal, whatever the place, you know, all over the place. Okay, not very useful. But what you can do is you can take the Fourier transform of that signal, and you do it numerically using a, a method that we'll talk about in chapter nine. You take the Fourier transform of it, and you get a signal that's in terms of frequency. Omega, this is my Fourier transform. And what you end up guessing is that you know, there's a bunch of noise which occurs at very low frequency and you get a signal that looks like this, and then at a certain point, you get a peak. And then you get, you know, you roll down. And that peak will relate to the dominant frequency in that signal. So you've got a random signal, you're not quite sure what's going on, but you take the Fourier transform, you get a dominant peak. And that dominant peak will relate to the roll frequency. You've got the frequency, you can work out what L is. You can therefore work out where the central gravity of the boat is. That's the theory. And this happens all over the place in sound. You can take the Fourier transform of the sound, you get peaks of frequencies and stuff. So that's just an example. So, like I said, the signal's in the time domain function while the tone is the frequency domain function. And the tone is what's important, okay? Um, Fourier transforms and its inverse allows you to go between the two. <coughs> 